Okay, continuing in 1 Timothy for the spring semester of 2023, uh, Paul instructs Timothy on how the church should be organized and run, therefore instructing us as well on how the church should run. And we see uh, a lot of issues here concerning women and their role in the church. Uh, women have always played a primary role in the church and will always will have a primary role in the church. But there are scriptural qualifications for their responsibilities, just like there are scriptural qualifications for men and their responsibilities here. Uh, the responsibility here, first of all, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And that's the key right here, is modest apparel. Uh, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, the scripture here is not condemning earrings and gold and uh, braided hair, braided hair, uh, or pearls, anything like that. Uh, what the scripture is saying is that our appearance should not be what we wear, but who we are. And so it says to them, with Montsville, but shame fades this in sobriety. That's the key. To present a proper testimony. Uh, it's not what we wear that makes us spiritual, but sometimes if we're, spirit, if we're spiritual, it will make us what we wear. Uh, if our testimony is more important than anything else, and modesty is the key. And we, we have to go to make sure that we're not choosing just one fashion over the other. And I know a lot of people have a problem with women uh, wearing slacks. Uh, biblically speaking, they have no basis for that. Now, if that's their opinion, that's their opinion, and that's fine. I have no problem with people having the opinion that women should not wear slacks. I don't see it personally, but if that's your, your choice, that's your choice. But you can't say that it's biblically that it's wrong for a woman to wear uh, slacks. It's just not in the Bible. I mean, when the Bible talks about a man should not wear it, that pertains to a woman. And a woman wears that pertains to a man. It's saying that men should look like men and women should look like women. And it's fairly easy in our society to tell what applies to a male or, and a female. So the, the debate is not whether it's slacks or a dress, the debate on is it modest or immodest. And that's the key, is to make sure that uh, we all are modest in our apparel, in the way that we present ourselves with the right attitude of the heart, not relying upon these things to, to judge our spirituality. You know, they have all the gold, therefore they, God must be blessing them because they're rich. And that's not the case in any way whatsoever. But to make sure that we are, are modest in our apparel. Uh, the restrictions, that I suffer not a woman to teach, allow a woman to teach, nor you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, I know this picks up a lot of controversy in the way we are today in our society. Uh, the rules and the lines between men and women have changed drastically uh, in the wrong direction, I believe. Uh, but when it talks about this, it's saying basically the woman... Can a woman speak in church? Yes. Can she talk in church? Yes. Can she say things in church from the Bible? Absolutely. That's not what it's talking about. And then we talked about to uh, be in silence. Uh, it's not saying that a woman can't speak. It's, this is the way that they are to learn, uh, to, to hear, and then uh, to discuss it in their homes is fine. But within the church, uh, I don't have a problem with women being Sunday school teachers. I don't have a problem with... Uh, women in roles of education in any way whatsoever. There's nothing in the Bible against that. Uh, but when it comes to the church, and that's what we're talking about here, is that the leadership of the church. I don't believe that women should be pastors. And I know uh, some of you students, our background is in churches where uh, women are pastors. I just don't see it in the scripture. And according to 1 Timothy 2.12, they're not allowed to have that authority over the man. But again, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 talks about women praying and prophesying in the church. So, can women pray in church? Yes. Can they speak in church? Yes. Uh, prophesying it here is not fulfilling the future, foretelling the future. It's just stating what God has said. So, just what God's word, word said. That's the prophecy. And you give it back to the church. So, I have no problem with that. Uh, I know of a church that uh, recently, where the pastor said that he, uh, he was asked to speak preaching a revival and, and he did at a church some, I'm not sure exactly where it was at his home church is 
uh, nearby. I'm not going to mention it's not important as to who it is. But when he was asked to speak, he said they had a woman pray uh, during the service. And he said, I will never, ever go back to that church again. Uh, well, there's nothing in the Bible saying women can't do that. Uh, if that's a church's uh, uh, rules, then they can have that rule. I mean, when Matthew 16 talks about what, uh, binding and loosing, uh, binding and loosing is basically uh, uh, agreeing that this is okay and this is not okay out, from outside the Bible. Now, the Bible the Bible's always right. You always do what the Bible says. If it's a rule that's not in the Bible, bring drinks into the uh, uh, congregation area, into the church, uh, bring water or what have you. Uh, I know one person uh, doesn't allow their kids to have any candy in church, and it's wrong for them to get candy in church. If the church wants to have that rule, have it. Uh, and if you're going to that church, follow the rule. Or if not, you're being rebellious, and that's a sin. Uh, if you can't follow that rule, then there's other churches to go to. But let's be careful about not, about not imposing uh, our beliefs onto others outside the Scripture. Now, if my belief is in line with the Scripture, then yes, I'm going to impose that on other people. But if it's just my opinion, then, uh, you know, I, personally, I never have, I don't know why, I never have liked to see a man wear a necklace, unless it was military dog tags, and that, for me, I had no problem with it. But other than that, I never could see a man wearing a necklace. And so, I, I just think it's, it's, it should not happen. Is that in the Bible? No. Are there men wear necklaces? Yeah. Scripturally, they're not wrong. But do I like it? No. I don't have to like it. It's not, the world is not dependent on what I want or I don't want. The world should be dependent on what God wants, found in the Word of God. So, two factors are, that are involved in this, though. Uh, creation. Uh, Timothy, Paul told Timothy, he said, the fact of original corruption says, in, or, Adam was first formed, then Eve. Uh, and then, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So, whatever reason, God chose to not allow women to teach after this matter. And said that women, uh, uh, Eve was deceived, but man sinned, Adam sinned willfully which to me is the greater sin. Uh, both are wrong, but the greater is to willfully sin. We're talking about silence. It's not talking about total silence. And, uh, what we have to do is look up the word silence in the Bible and find out the many different definitions. And you'll find that a lot of words in our uh, vocabulary today have a lot of different definitions. And if we're used to one, then we impose that upon all of them sometimes. We have to go back to what does it, the original word mean. What it means is settle down, undisturbed, or not unruly. And we see that in Acts 22.2. Uh, 2. I'll read that to you. I meant to add these to the handout. It's fine. I did not do that, obviously. It says, when they heard them speak in the original tongue to them, they kept the more silence, as he said. So, uh, and then 2 Thessalonians 3, 12. Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So, here is the idea of not being unruly. And so... That's what it's talking about when we keep silence there in the church. Uh, again, when we're in silence, that's all subjection. In, concerning widows in the church, uh, the church has a responsibility to take care of its own. Now, we know people will always take advantage of this. If uh, they feel like they get a free handout, then they'll get a free handout. But, it's talking about the church taking care of its own, not the church taking care of the world. We can't do it. I mean, and, and the lo one local church can't take care of the world, and so, but we do have responsibility to those within the church. Now, does it mean we support them 100% financially? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that people in the church help the people in the church, uh, and don't let somebody suffer uh, uh, wrongfully because the church is not helping. We live in a world today where we have government. Uh, not government aid, but we have Social Security, which is not a, a government aid. It's, 
my money that I paid into over my working career that was invested, and now I get that money back upon retirement or whatever it might be, and that's the way we all work. So that's not government aid. Government aid is just a free ride uh, that no matter what, you don't have to work on I mean, you give you money. And I think a lot of people think the church is going to, should be like that, that the church should give a handout. I remember uh, a pastor at our church here talking about somebody approached him one time and asked for money for uh, uh, one of their family members who needed uh, braces or something like that and wanted the church to pay for it. So, well, that's not church responsibility to do that. Uh, but it is uh, taking care of those who can't help themselves. Uh, so we have instructions here on dealing with the widows in the congregation. We have, uh, in the Bible, widows and orphans are often viewed as special objects of God. Uh, and so the church should watch over them, should help in ways. Like I say, not take full control and not just give a handout, but to help in ways that we, we can help. Deuteronomy 10, uh, 18, 14, 29, 24, 17 through 21. You can look those passages up if you'd like. Talking about the responsibilities of uh, uh, care taken towards the widows and the orphans. Acts chapter 6 and James 1, 27. Again, our responsibility to help other people. Uh, and when they take it, try to take advantage of that help, then yeah, things need to stop at that point. But if they legitimately need help, we have responsibility. Deuteronomy here says, He doth ex execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and raiment. So, so widows over 60 uh, with no living children. Uh, children have responsibility to take care of the parents. Just as the parents had the responsibility to take care of that child until they were 18, uh, things reverse later in age, and we have a responsibility to help if at, at all possible. Uh, and so, widows over 60 with no living children are to be honored and, and helped out, provided for. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, Paul said, honor widows that really are widows indeed. Uh, not those taking advantage of, uh, trying to take advantage of the system, but those who really, truly need help. Uh, let not a widow be taken in number if they're under 60, having been the wife of one man. So, uh, Basically, what Paul here is saying that if you know a woman's a widow at the age of 20, then and never got uh, married again, well, they have responsibility uh, to get help any way they can, whether it's to get married again or what have you. But it's a little bit confusing the way I said it, I think. But nevertheless, what the screen here has to say. Uh, very importantly, widows with the family are provided for by their family. Uh, as I said before, if any widow had children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Verse 25, 16, if any man or woman that believe have widows, let them relieve them, let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So, uh, again, the first option is the children. Uh, if they have children, that's their responsibility to take care of the widows. Yeah. Young widows, uh, the rule here, let them remarry and raise children. Nothing wrong with people getting married again if, uh, uh, if their loved one or their spouse passes. Uh, and sometimes this will keep them from immorality. Uh, the physical relationship between the husband and wife, uh, that desire may continue after the spouse is gone. And therefore, the best thing they do, if they can't control themselves, is to get married again. But the young widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. Having judgment, damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. Remember, the word damnation is a strong, powerful word in our society. Uh, and typically, when we hear the word damnation, we talk about people going to hell. But the word actually is just a very strong word for judgment uh, because they cast off their first faith. And with all, they have learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers, busybodies here, you know, gossips who have nothing else to do in life and so all they do is sit around and talk. And that's what I've talked about many times in the past with uh, the way the church should be run. Uh, when I think about two great leaders of the Bible, 
uh, Joshua and Moses, two great men of God, two men that God honored in many ways because of their faithfulness to him. But in the life of Moses, for 40 years in the wilderness, he, all he heard was complaining, bickering back and forth, murmuring. The Bible talks about murmuring and how the people constantly murmur. Joshua, things are completely different. In his day, you don't have, hear the murmur. You don't hear the complaining. Why is that? Why, why cause was Joshua a better leader than Moses? No. The circumstances were completely different. In Moses' day, the people had nothing to do except for wander around the wilderness. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have to make clothes. They didn't have to uh, plant farms. God took care of their needs during that time. Gave them water, gave them manna, what have you. Uh, and so, basically, they sat around and did nothing. And when people don't have anything to do, they talk. Well, in Joshua's day, they had to go in, take the land. They had to separate the people into their respective tribes. They had to uh, build houses if they needed to. They had to plant gardens or take over gardens that the Canaanites had left behind. They had to fight. But they constantly had work to do. And when they had work to do, they, didn't, they weren't idle, sitting around doing anything. They were busy serving, and so they didn't have time for gossip. In our churches, if people don't have anything to do in our churches, they're going to sit around and do nothing. If people are busy working in our churches, then the church will prosper. And that's the problem sometimes that pastors may not see. Uh, they have problems in their church, and they don't know why. Well, have you given that person something to do, some way to serve? Not a leadership position. You don't give people who aren't faithful leadership positions, but you do give them something to do. And then when they become faithful, they could be elevated to a leadership position. Young widows, uh, again, going in. Uh, then concerning seniors in the church, if you're not an elder, we have a responsibility to respect those who've come before us. Uh, but then treat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, younger as sisters with all purity. We have a responsibility to respect one another. Whether it be the elder or the younger, it doesn't make any difference. Honor those who have come before us. Learn from those, learn the right things from those who have come before us. And then concerning elders in the church or leaders in the church. That word elder has a few different meanings, it all depends upon context. Elder could be an older person. Elder could be a, a leader of the church like a pastor. Or an elder could be just a spiritual person within the church. Uh, the spiritual uh, elders of the church. Uh, I don't believe in uh, multiple pastors. Uh, there are some churches today who think that uh, they have a pastor and they have a co-pastor and an assistant pastor and an associate pastor. Uh, biblically speaking, none of those titles are correct. Uh, a pastor is correct. Uh, but Or if you want to call it elder, that's fine. Uh, I heard of a church out in California who uh, well, was John MacArthur uh, who said this. He said, any church with one pastor is a cult. Because uh, he said one pastor to lead them astray. Well, yeah, it's true one pastor could lead them astray, but that one pastor doesn't make it a cult. I guarantee you, if you go to the church that he's at, wherever it is, I don't know the name of it, but uh, he is supposed to be one of the elders of the church. And you ask who is ultimately in control of that church, and everyone will say John MacArthur. It won't be another elder, it will be him. He is the one person who's in charge of the church. Uh, and that's because that's how it has to be anyway. If you have two people in leadership, I worked for a company where two brothers owned the company, and it was 50-50. And they constantly fought over everything. I mean, sometimes physically fought over everything. If one of them spent $20, the other would come and find out how much money they spent. was $20. I only spent $19.80, so I need 20 cents. I mean, literally, one day, I, one of them came to me. Uh, I dealt with the, the finances. And they wanted a few dollars because their, his brother had spent more than he did that, that month or week. I thought, how ridiculous that is. Anytime you have two leadership, you have two different directions. And so in a church, if you have two, leadership, two leaders, you will go in two different directions. That's why God wanted one leader of the church, and whatever title you want to give them doesn't make any difference, but you have one leader of the church, and then the people follow that leader. If the leader's corrupt, the church then no, no longer follows the leader. So, first of all, it says lay hands suddenly on no man. I know people like to talk, use this in reference to 
physically attacking somebody. But it's talking about laying hands upon them, uh, to anoint them into the ministry. Now, God appoints the leadership. Right? The church doesn't choose the pastor. Uh, God chooses the pastor. It goes back to Acts 13, a prime example of, in reference to missionaries, but the same principle. When uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 1, he talks about Barnabas and others within the church. Saul, at that time before he became Paul, was in the church, and they were actively working in the church. They were participating in the ministry of the church. And so verse 2, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein I have called them. So the Holy Spirit did the calling, told the church, and then the church would lay hands upon Barnabas and Saul and appoint them to be missionaries on the field. But it wasn't the church who gave them the ability to be missionaries. It was the church recognizing that this is what the Holy Spirit said to do. And so, when we talk about laying hands selling on no man, it means be careful how you select the leaders. And chapter 3 of 1 Timothy goes into the pastoral qualifications. And if you follow every one of those qualifications, then after that, if you have two people that meet all those qualifications and you can't discern, then you pray and pray and pray, and God will give you discernment over that. Um, but if they don't meet the qualifications, then they shouldn't be considered. It should be completely what God says in His Word. The churches sometimes pick and choose people they want or they like. They uh, often, sometimes will pick uh, a pastor because the former pastor selected them to take over after he was gone. And it may or may not be of God, just because sometimes a, a, a son will take over after a father, uh, and that's not necessarily right. I mean, Manasseh became king after Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a good king. Manasseh was a wicked king. So they didn't work out very well. Uh, and for churches, it's not going to either. Only if God calls that person. I remember having a young man years ago uh, said he was coming to the college and how he was just so grateful, how God worked it out and God blessed it. And it's a miracle because uh, uh, he finally found a college he can go to where he can continue his job and come to the college. And God just opened up the door for him, and I thought, well, you know, that's great, that's wonderful. And then he said, you know, one day I want to become a pastor. He said, my grandfather's a pastor, and I think he'd just be neat if I became pastor after he died. And I thought, no, that's not the way it works. It's not going to be neat to become a pastor because your grandfather was. If, if God wants you to be the pastor, yeah, that's great. He didn't come back, he didn't come to school after that. I didn't criticize him. I just said, you know, if it's what God calls you to do, then, then yeah, praise God for that. But he just told me how God opened up the door, how God worked a miracle, how this college was got an answer to prayer, and he never showed up, never came back. Well, that's not really a qualification, meets the qualification of a pastor. Uh, not honest, not a, uh, if he really believed this is where God wanted him, this is where he would be at. Uh, to be honored, uh, the leadership that should be honored, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine, uh, teachers. You know, I, I respect the scriptures. I am a teacher. I'm worthy of, of double honor. Now, uh, this word honor uh, can refer financially, yes, and it does, uh, but proper respect. I'm, I'm not demanding respect or honor. I'm just telling you what the, the word of God says. If people don't honor me, I'm not going to do anything about that. If I don't and I'm not paid for the ministry, uh, I, there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, should I be? Well, for the scriptures say, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So, should a person be paid in the ministry? Yes, if, if at all possible, uh, if they're truly ministering for God. Uh, some churches, they pay the pastor extremely well, and they don't do anything. Some churches, the pastor does everything, and they don't pay him well. Well, God's going to take care of that. Uh, God will meet the, those needs there. But the church will suffer if they're not taking care of the uh, person that they should be taking care of. Uh, the church definitely will suffer for that. Uh, and you know, people say, well, the pastor never complained. Well, he probably, if he's a man of God, he's not one good one. Uh, but it's still that responsibility. I know the church had 700 people. Uh, two churches at one time. I know they had over 700 people in the church. And the pastor had, most pastors had to work full-time jobs uh, because the church didn't pay them enough. 
And I'm thinking, that's, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. If a church can afford to pay a pastor, they should pay a pastor. If they can't afford to, then the pastor, uh, like Paul said, there was times when Paul said he had to make tents to get by. So sometimes the pastor may have to do that. Uh, I've always worked a secular job to, to uh, take care of my family. Uh, the ministry has never given me a full-time salary. Uh, I taught Christian school 1987 through uh, 1993 years. Uh, I made seven thousand dollars a year back then, and that look look at that, that's not much money back then. Uh, but I did it because I believe that's where God wanted me to be, uh, and so I started working secular jobs to take care. Uh, why? Because God expected me to provide for my family, take care of things. Uh, if the church pays right, praise God. If they don't, God's going to chasten the church. I mean, the labor is worthy of his reward. It's what the Bible says. Uh, and that's what we should always go by. Here, when an accusation comes against a, an elder in the church, and it's not just a pastor, but any spiritual person within the church, any leadership in the church, your first instinct when that accusation is made is to not believe it. It says, against an elder, see, not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Now, you know, somebody comes to you and say, well, I heard so-and-so did this. Then you need one or two more witnesses. And not one or two more witnesses that listen to the first person. It's not like I, I, I go to the person and say, you know, this person... The pastor's doing this, and then this person, together this person, they go back before the church and say, well, the pastor's been doing this. How do you know this? Well, because he told me. Well, wait a minute, that's just still only one witness. So if that one person spreads it to ten, you still only have one witness. You don't have ten, you have one, nine who listened to gossip and one who was a gossiper. And so be very, very careful about receiving an accusation uh, that incorrectly. Now, a pastor can do things wrong, but you have to have two or three witnesses. Or a leader in the church, but you have to have two or three witnesses. Uh, remember the woman taken in adultery in the book of John, where the religious leaders bring this woman uh, before Jesus, thinking that we've got Jesus on this one. We, we can trap him, because whatever happens, we're going to win. Because we're going to take this woman, taken in adultery, and tell Jesus this is a woman who's caught in a very act of adultery. And according to the Mosaic Law, you should stone her to death. What are you going to do? And if he does stone her to death, then we can go to the Roman government and say, Jesus stoned her to death. What are you going to do against him? And so we got this, no matter what happens. If, if Jesus doesn't do that, if he doesn't stone her to death, then we're going to tell the Jews that Jesus didn't follow the law. So win-win situation for us. And so they brought the woman... Jesus sat there, and then he said, those of you without sin, cast the first stone. And the Bible says, from the eldest to the least, they got out. They left. Why? Well, first of all, if a woman's taken in adultery, that means there's a minimum of two people have to be involved in that. So where's the man? Well, I think the man was there. In fact, I think the men were there. I think it's very likely, and, and I don't know this for sure, but I think it's very likely that that woman was a prostitute. And that she had been with these different men at times. And now they decided to use her as in, uh, to help them out. Well, when Jesus said, those without sin cast first stone, they all left. Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn them. Because according to the law, I had to have two or three witnesses. There's no witnesses anymore. If they all left, no witnesses. So Jesus did exactly what he should have done. Didn't stone her to death. Did, was she a sinner? Yes, he knew that. He told her to go and sin no more. But following the law, Jesus put himself under the law, and so he, he fulfilled the law at that point. Well, that's the way we assume innocence until we're proven guilty. That's what we should do towards all people. Never, just because somebody says something, don't believe it because you don't like the person. Okay? Make sure of it. Concerning the rich in the church, uh, next week we'll go into this, but very importantly, their faith is to be placed in God, not in gold. Okay? Don't trust your money. I mean, there's people who pray and pray and pray and pray that they win the lottery, thinking that if they did that, then all the problems go away. No, that's not going to do it. It will help who you are. It's not going to make you a different person. 
it make you wealthy, but it also may kill you. Uh, it may get you so far away from God, uh, because those that seek after wealth, well, charge in their riches well that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives uh, us richly all things to enjoy. You want to be rich? Well, trust God, and He'll give you richly all things to enjoy. Money is not necessarily going to bring that. Right, let's take a break.